1867, people of all types crowded up to the 14th Street Armory in New York City to attend the 37th Annual American Institute Fair, where an enterprising inventor was demonstrating a revolutionary new idea. Only four years previously, the London Underground, the world's first subway system, had been opened, but they were plagued by the soot of their steam-powered engines. The inventor of this new device, Alfred Beach, promised something similar and yet different. But his vision for the future of transportation would end up mired in the politics and economics of its present. The history of New York's secret subway deserves to be remembered. Alfred Beach was born on September 1st, 1826, in Springfield, Massachusetts, the son of Moses Beach, owner of the New York Sun, and one of the founders of the Associated Press. The Beach family became wealthy thanks to the paper, and Alfred was sent to a prestigious private school for his education. His father had not been born wealthy and had shown an interest in invention early in his life, inventing a rag-cutting machine and attempting to manufacture a gunpowder engine for propelling balloons. Alfred's first job was selling newspapers on the corner of New York City streets as a newsboy, but he was soon setting type and later became a reporter. In 1845, Alfred and several friends paid $800 for the then-obscure Scientific American magazine. The magazine had only a few hundred subscribers when they purchased it. Beach soon launched the Scientific American Patent Agency, which promised to help inventors secure patents, for a fee, of course. It was the first business of its kind, and soon the agency was filing 3,000 patents a year, and by 1848 the magazine had 10,000 readers. Through Scientific American, Beach helped Thomas Edison patent the photograph. He also worked with Alexander Graham Bell and Samuel Morse. In 1848, Moses Beach retired and left control of the son to Alfred, then just age 22, and his brother. Alfred was not just the proprietor of the most important magazine on inventions, but like his father, was a tinkerer, too. In 1856, he appeared at the American Institute Fair with an improvement to the typewriter, which could make embossed letters, which he saw as a means of helping the blind. While it was never produced, it won a gold medal and first prize at the fair that year and was recognized as the most advanced typewriting machine yet. The typewriter was hardly his most ambitious project. From his office on the top floor in New York City, he had a good view of the crowded city streets and the ferries that increasingly carried commuters from Manhattan, Staten Island, and New Jersey. City streets in the mid-19th century were often muddy, trash-strewn, and literally covered in horse poop. Large cities moved slowly as gridlock carriages fought for inches and horses screamed. We can travel from New York halfway to Philadelphia in less time than the length of Broadway, complained a writer in the New York Tribune. Beach's own short walk from his home to his office could take an hour and was fraught with the possibility of getting crushed or trampled. As author and physician Asa Green wrote, To cross the street in New York, you must button your coat tight about you, see that your shoes are secure at the heels, settle your hat firmly on your head, look up street and down street at the selfsame moment to see what carts and carriages are upon you, and then run for your life. Beach proposed a solution in Scientific American in November that year. Nothing less than a railway underneath instead of above. This subterranean passage is to be laid down with double track, with a road for foot passengers on either side, the whole to be brilliantly lighted with gas. He imagined carriages pulled by horses, with openings to his subway on every corner. While his idea might seem preescient today, it was widely ridiculed at the time. One critic opined, It is better to wait for the devil than to make roads down to hell. The issue of city congestion was well established, and solutions had appeared. In 1827, a predecessor to the bus, which could carry 12 people, was constructed for Abraham Bauer. He charged 12 cents a trip, but the idea only caught on in New York and Boston. In Europe, Paris and London were home to an even larger vehicle, an omnibus. In 1831, Bauer introduced an omnibus to New York and soon had over 100 of the things, horse-drawn, in the city. The buses, however, were dangerous and dirty and often raced each other for fares, grazing lampposts all the way. The New York Herald would eventually describe them exasperatedly as bedlam on wheels, while another writer said that they were dirty and filled with brutal ruffians. By 1832, 30 passenger trolleys driven by horse along rails in the city were first introduced in New York. None solved the problem of traffic. On January 9, 1863, London welcomed the Metropolitan Railway after four years of digging through the dirt to produce the world's first subway. To Londoners, the system became known as the Underground, or is better known today, the Tube. 
But the initial system wasn't without its problems. The trains were steam-powered, and burning steam engines poured soot-filled smoke into the tunnels. The chief inspector of railways warned that an underground road is enormously expensive to construct and interfered with above-ground transportation while it was being built, that it can never be wholesome or free of deleterious gases, and in foggy weather is always full of a thick atmosphere, which is very disagreeable to the passengers. Around the same time, Beach also heard about another British invention. In 1853, Josiah Latimer Clark had built the Electric and International Telegraph Company, a one-and-a-half-inch tube from a telegraph station to the London Stock Exchange. Their tube was pneumatic and delivered small canisters with telegraphs to brokers. With Thomas Webster Rammel, Clark was able to sell the tubes to the British Post, and in 1863 they had carts installed in the system, which brought parcels and letters straight from the railway to the post office. Mechanics Magazine declared that we feel tolerably certain that the day is not very distant when metropolitan railway traffic can be conducted on this principle. Beats certainly thought so. By 1865, Beach had patented his own pneumatic mail system, which he envisioned beneath all of the city streets. People could drop a letter into a hollow streetlight, which would be collected by a small rail car. He also began preparation for his display at the 1867 American Institute Fair. Beach brought two inventions, and he knew that a flare for the dramatic could sell an invention. His first invention was a 24-foot-long tube, two feet wide, which could move packages by air pressure. Much more impressive was his second display, which hung from the ceiling, stretching across the room. He had built a long plywood tube, and inside was a cylindrical car that just barely fit within. The car could hold ten people and was powered by a large steam-powered fan. With access to Scientific American and the New York Sun, it was simple to drum up excitement, and thousands came to the fair just to take a ride on Beach's pneumatic contraption. Before the fair opened, he had declared in Scientific American that he had developed a system of transportation swift as Aeolus, god of the breezes, and silent as Somnus, god of sleep and dreams. Halfway through the fair, Scientific American carried an article which began, The most novel and attractive feature of the exhibition is by general consent conceded to be the pneumatic railway. It is probable that a pneumatic railway of considerable length for regular traffic will soon be laid down near New York, Beach predicted. More than 75,000 people would ride the railway by the end of the fair. The New York Times wrote that passengers through a city tube could be carried from City Hall to Madison Square in five minutes, to Harlem and Manhattanville in 14 minutes, to Washington Heights in 20 minutes. Beach won top prize. A good idea is not, however, by itself enough to change the world. Beach was facing opposition from two important forces. Property owners like John Jacob Astor III, who didn't want New York City's streets dug up to build subways and the powerful leader of the New York City political machine, William Boss Tweed. Tweed refused to let Beach get funding or a charter. In 1869, Beach instead applied for a pneumatic mail system by proposing a mail tube near Broadway. He planned two four-and-a-half-foot diameter tubes, too small for people to ride. And Tweed gave the go-ahead, and Beach was granted a 50-year charter. But Beach never intended to give up that easily. With Tweed satisfied, Beach returned to the legislature asking for a minor change. Instead of two tubes, he would build one larger tube at a cheaper rate than the two. The two smaller tubes would be contained within the larger tunnel. He also deleted the clause for regulatory inspection. Tweed seems not to have noticed the significance of the changes. The scene was set for Beach to build his subway in secret, almost right across the street from City Hall. To prove to property owners it wouldn't disturb their property, Beach invented a drill with a unique curved shield that used hydraulic rams. could move 16 inches of soil at a time. Beginning in the gigantic basement of Devlin's clothing store, two floors underground, his teams worked at night, trucking out dirt in wagons. It was not easy work, claustrophobic and sometimes terrifying. They could dig up to eight feet a night. During construction, the shield of Beach's digger suddenly ground to a halt and the shield buckled. They had to run into a solid wall, apparently from an old Dutch fort that had been there before the Revolution. It was unclear if removing the wall would cause damage to the road above, but the workers chipped away at the wall, which didn't cause total collapse. It was impossible to keep the work secret, as huge pieces of machinery waited on the street and dirt constantly came to the surface. Reports on the work were common and speculation rife. New York Mayor Abraham Hall became suspicious and sent an aide with an order to inspect the construction when a part of Broadway sunk into the ground slightly. But the aide was refused entry because Beach's change in the legislation excluded regulatory oversight. In a statement, Beach brushed aside rumors. In reference to the ridiculous stories that have been circulated about our men being sworn to secrecy and the doors being closed to all persons, there is no truth to them. 
Meanwhile, he was outfitting his large car to look like a lounge and hold 22 people. His enormous fan, actually a mine ventilation fan, weighed 50 tons. It drew air through a grate, which caused winds so great it could blow a passerby's hat off. The car could achieve speeds of six miles an hour, blown halfway where it hit a bell and then the fan was reversed, bringing it to a smooth stop. In January of 1870, one of Beach's partners assured everyone that public inspection would soon be welcomed and mentioned a waiting room. It was becoming clear that Beach wasn't building a mail tube. On January 11th, a New York Daily Tribune reporter who somehow got access to the tunnel reported on the entire thing. Beach's son Frederick later claimed that the reporter had been disguised as a workman, but it is difficult to ignore the brilliant marketing tactic that leaking the description of the project was. Beach had spent some $70,000 building a stunning waiting room, 120 feet long, with paintings, chandeliers, mirrors, a grand piano, and even a fountain stocked with goldfish. On February 26, 1870, Beach finally invited lawmakers, dignitaries, and reporters into the basement. The response was universal acclaim. Certainly the most novel, if not the most successful enterprise that New York has seen for many a day is the pneumatic tunnel under Broadway, wrote the New York Times. A myth or a humbug it has hitherto been called by everybody who has been excluded from its interior, but now it will be open to the public. Such is expected to find a dismal cavernous retreat. Open their eyes at the elegant reception room in the light, airy tunnel and the general appearance of taste and comfort. Beach opened the subway to the public on March 1st, 1870 at 25 cents a ride. He promised to donate all the proceeds to the Union House for the orphans of soldiers and sailors. The public rode and rode and rode, some simply remaining in their seats as it traveled one block one way and then back the other. Beach promised that the day had passed when a snowstorm could cripple the city and travel would soon be free of horses in crowded streets. We propose to run the line to Central Park, about five miles in all, Beach said, and when completed, we should be able to carry 20,000 passengers a day at speeds up to a mile a minute. In less than a year, 400,000 people rode Beach's subway. Beach was raising money and seeking to get an extension of his line. But Tweed had his own plan and was possibly angry at being fooled. He had the legislature pass his viaduct plan, which called for elevated rail lines throughout the city, at the same time as Beach's, and both bills arrived on the governor's desk. New York Governor John Hoffman vetoed Beach's bill and approved Tweed's. But Tweed wasn't invincible. Dogged by criticism in the press and a deadly riot, the New York Times began to get information from a new state auditor through former Sheriff James O'Brien about the city's accounts, which laid bare the ring's embezzlement of city funds. Tweed's power crumbled, and he was arrested. It took Beach a year and a half to get another bill before the Senate, and in the interim he had decided that his pneumatic system was impractical and he'd have to use steam engines. The bill passed on April 6, 1873, but it was too late. After years of waiting, he didn't have investors ready, and the economy collapsed in September. The Depression was so bad that it became known at the time as the Great Depression, until the Depression in the 1930s proved even worse. Beach was bankrupt and exhausted, and he gave up his dream. His tumble was converted into a shooting gallery and then a wine vault before he finally sealed it up in 1874. The tunnel, which was located where the City Hall subway station is today, was destroyed in 1912 by workers who were expanding the New York City subway system, which had been opened in 1904. They said at the time that the tunnel had been left virtually intact, that the piano was still in the waiting room. Beach himself did not live to see the New York City subway. He passed away in 1896. Of course, pneumatic messaging systems are still around today. You see them in bank drive throughs They're being used in some hospitals, some businesses. The CIA had a large pneumatic messaging system in its headquarters until 1989. The website Tomorrow's World Today notes that in 2021, the global pneumatic tube market was valued at $2.4 billion. And while pneumatic people transportation hasn't yet taken hold, technologies such as VAC trains and hyperloops have gained enough traction that in 2021, the U.S. Department of Transportation released proposed rules to regulate such technology. And so Beach's vision of transportation from the past might yet become our mode of mass transportation in the future. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.